Yeah, of course. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Table Crashers episode 44. Uh, the game we're playing this evening, or at least we're going to teach you about this evening, is Dino Genix. And uh, I'm joined with Richard Keane from Ninth Haven Games. And uh, he's going to be, we're going to do a little interview, uh, get to probe his mind, the mind of the designer. And uh, welcome, Richard. Thanks for joining us this evening. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll just jump right into it. That's, that's the best way to do this. Um, you're this is you were a first time Kickstarter, uh, uh, and you're that, that is correct. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> no, it's okay. No, it's okay. So you're a first time Kickstarter, um, which has its own challenges, uh, and and little mountains you have to overcome, um, and you're also in the middle of fulfillment now. Um, so what lessons have you learned? Uh, many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has been a very interesting. Uh, year actually about a year and a half now um this successful kickstarter was actually a follow-up to one that did not fully pan out for us okay um so that itself was a learning experience um basically we learned early on that being a first-time developer uh nobody is going to cut you any slack with your presentation or anything like that yep um and basically, even if you are the underdog, you still are expected to have the production values of, you know, the the six million dollar, and that yeah. that uh, that was probably the biggest learning experience our first time around. Um, yeah. When we first went to Kickstarter, the game was done, of course, but mm -hmm. some of the artwork was in a mostly finished state. Um, there was a little bit left to be done on that. Right. Uh, but it didn't captivate people as much as we would have liked. And so after we kind of closed that campaign down, we went back, we made sure all of the artwork was finished. We added a little bit more extra polish to that. Um, okay. We revamped quite a bit of it as well. And that uh, made a bit more of a splash when we relaunched about a month later. Right, and it's 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 unfortunate because um, the platform itself was designed to potentially kickstart companies from the beginning, and the nature of the beast has sort of become you know, bring your marketing team, bring your best art, bring a prepared game to the table, not something that's in an idea phase, but something that's pretty much done already. It's almost like a marketplace, which I know that they they're they're avoiding uh, as as a as a platform, but um, it's one of the unfortunate things that I think has sort of happened over, especially the last year, I think, right? Uh, yeah, it has become more and more competitive as, you know, the, the really big guys have kind of moved in on it. Um, right. They probably don't need Kickstarter, but because they can use it as the marketing platform to get their audience there, right? Um, it basically means that anybody from a smaller, you know, background trying to get funded is mm -hmm. competing directly with them one way or another. Yeah, but I mean, like you said, lesson learned, and uh, you know, you funded. You're 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 chugging along. How many backers did you end up with in, in your final tally between both uh, <sighs> Kickstarter and the other unfortunate beast you have to deal with uh, the the follow up campaign or uh, what is it called the the backer kit? Much sure. sure. So on the the Kickstarter itself, uh, I believe we were just under three thousand. Um, oh, okay. backers and with Crowdox, which we use for uh, late backer fulfillment, we ended up with another hundred or two hundred people. That's good. So, that's not that's not bad to round it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually very respectable for a first time Kickstarter. So yeah. I'm very yeah. fortunate for that. <laughs> well, you you brought a good game to the table, uh, which we'll be discussing when we actually crash the table later. Uh, but um, what personally led you into game design and self publication And I guess, in turn, what made you decide to go with publishing yourself? Uh, so, basically, this, this may come across a, a little cheesy, but as far back as I can remember as a kid, I've mm -hmm. always wanted to be a game developer. Um, <laughs> way back then, I assumed that it was going to be more developing video games or computer games game something like that yeah. however college was a strong teacher that i probably wasn't cut out for that side of thing right, however right. i still love the idea of mechanics and how uh, everything functions together 
And, you know, um, one of the reasons uh, we kind of reached out to you originally is your the, the stuff you do with Tabletop Simulator, because that was also kind of the getting my foot in the door for game development as well, because yeah. Tabletop Simulator is a great tool for prototype. It sure is. Absolutely. And it basically allowed me to put together an idea very rapidly. And then um, I'm based out of Vermont, which uh, is not the largest state, but it basically meant that I could get uh, game testers <laughs> from all over the world to, well, not all over the world, but around the United States anyways, to uh, yeah. play test the game. And that was great because that opened up, you know, literally hundreds of people to play test this that otherwise would not have been able to. Right. And it gives you, a, I mean, I, I, I have a background as a research psychologist um, when I was in school. So uh, that, that pool of, of information and, and that data set that you're getting from Tabletop Simulator and the online uh, presence of, of playtesters compared to the, like, your local regional area is, is also valuable information because you know, people think differently, which it might be weird, but people think differently across the country and the world. Uh, so, you know, a uh, critique from one person in Vermont compared to the critique from somebody over on the West Coast uh, is, is usually vastly different, right? It's true. And I, I can kind of, uh, a, a little bit of a tangent, but not really. Mm -hmm. um, when we actually went through with translation into other languages as well, mm -hmm. um, that was actually very helpful because... Um, you know, uh, most of our play testers were from the U S mm -hmm. and of course, just some of the language we had used in our rule book, while it's perfectly clear for us here, you, you go somewhere else and, you know, the little idiosyncrasies and our speech patterns, while it makes sense to us, they might have a slightly different meaning, uh, you know, across the pond here. Yeah, very true. That's very true. <laughs> um, so what, what, what of your life experiences do you draw upon when designing your games? Uh, it could be from the mechanical aspect of it, um, or, or it could be the theme aspect as well. Uh, a number of things. Um, I'm actually a graphic designer, web designer by trade. Like That mm -hmm. has been my day job for the last 10 years. Um, so there's actually a lot to be taken from that as far as like art direction, as far as, you know, graphic design in the game, making information easy to understand to a large right. number. Of um, and as I mentioned before, just like a general background in, uh, games as a kid, like I basically see everything that I've, you know, video games are a great teacher. It's a whole different media, but. Right you can take some learning lessons from that and kind of translate the best of it to a board game. Um, and then, of course, just learning from what other people have done. Like, there's a lot of great other designers in the industry. Some of the best uh, designers have only come forward, I think, in the last few years. So that's really exciting as well. And, and so it's just... I think to, to sort of add on to what you're saying there, I, I think that perception of the best designers in modern board gaming a lot of people who are entering the quote-unquote modern board gaming space are the disenfranchised and we talk about this a lot i know we do but it's the reality of the situation a lot of the uh, designers that are emerging in modern board gaming are the disenfranchised video game players who who left that that hobby space to move into board gaming so you're seeing a lot of translation of the higher level video game mechanics rpg systems and 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 things that they yearned for in video games and, and they're putting it to the table, which is, is modern board gaming is adding a lot of really interesting mechanics because they're trying to emulate not only the life event of doing something. So, for, so in your example, a dinosaur park, but they're also emulating how a video game would emulate running a dinosaur park. Right. Sure. It's like this two tiered emulation that's happening from, uh, a different design perspective before board games were just, okay, let's try to simulate this and let's make up a mechanic for it. Now the gaming history that we have from video games has sort of led us to this um, two tiered emulation because we could sort of, and I think the only way that's happening too is because uh, video game players are transitioning to the hobby space and they already understand the mechanics from video games. So there's not that extra translation to have. That's, that's my take on it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree with you. 
Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing too, because you see a little bit of the opposite as well, where um, I've seen some popular board games and they get translated back into video game mechanics. So everybody yeah. in the industry is kind of sharing with each other right now. And I think it makes everything, everything is made better for it. I agree. I absolutely agree with that. Um, so you mentioned uh, game designers that you sort of uh, took inspiration from and also games in the industry. Uh, are there any games or designers that you look up to or sort of like you, they're your idols and sort of like emulate some of the things that they've done? Uh, you have any examples of people like that or games? Um, to a degree, uh, like one of, one of the people that I really turned to early on when starting this company was uh, Jamie Stegmeier, okay, who yeah. uh, many people know is uh, the designer behind Scythe and numerous other great games. He's, he's, he's kind of the board game Kickstarter guru. He, he, sure. sort of, he, he sort of he packaged the whole experience up to, to help teach other people to, how to be successful in, in that, that realm. Very sure. So he he was actually one of the the main people I kind of turned to, uh, you know, just reading his blog. I even re mm -hmm. reached out to him personally a couple times. It was kind of a unique experience as a a, a newbie developer. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I I think I learned a lot there. But like honestly, the the most I learned is just doing it myself because while um some of the things that uh jamie references in his blog and whatnot are very useful yeah they yeah. don't begin to touch on the sorts of information you need to know to actually get a successful product off the ground well right because his his is how to successfully run a campaign and and, and fund um but it's the 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 back end of it turning that into a a, a, be a business following a kickstarter it, that's kind of absent and there really isn't a lot of people there aren't a lot of people it, within the hobby space especially within the kickstarter gu like uh, guru or, or, or advisors that take you to that next step because it's just like okay you're funded great you know congratulations um but there's not many people that that walk you through okay now let's make this a business right right um what what are your thoughts on that um do you think that that's that's something that will emerge or do you think that one of the reasons you don't, they're not teaching that is because they don't want that competition? I don't think it's that so much as it's going to be different for every person. Right. Um, like if you go into this with a large following already, it's going to be easier, but it's not yeah. by any means guaranteed. Right. And it's, you have to balance a lot of different things. Like over the last few months, uh, hiring additional artists, hiring, uh, designers hiring uh, yeah. factories in China, hiring uh, logistics companies to actually move all of these things around. And because this is a very small company, I have handled the majority of that. Right, of many day. hats. Yes. So yeah. it's there's a lot to handle. There's a lot to manage, and it is at times completely overwhelming. Like I'll be upfront <laughs> with that. <laughs> What what do you find the most overwhelming? Like uh, everybody has their their strong suits and their weaknesses, and usually the weaknesses are what causes that overwhelming feeling. What do you think is the most uh, overwhelming aspect of what you're dealing with and what you do? Um, in recent months, it really has been the logistics of moving, you know, three thousand five hundred units of a board game from China to countries all over the world. That's amazing, and yeah. like. Obviously, I have companies that are doing the actual legwork for it. However, there's there's very little clarifications. Like they expect you to know the the in between steps in order to get the product from you know X to Z before right. it even gets to them. Right. And right. So that that's kind of a it's a little bit of a stressor. And then you also yeah. have you know people rightly have their own experiences with different uh shipping companies that's actually something that we ran into a little bit with yep. some of our choices and you know we try to make the best choices we can mm -hmm. um a lot of this does come down to uh you know money uh, at the end of the day because you can hire the best people in the world but if you can't afford it 
yep. then you run into trouble and you know you, you might be successful this time around it may not happen again though <laughs> and, and it's funny because you know the price of admission is success uh into some of the higher tiered services as well because they're shopping you as well as you shopping them so like mm -hmm. as a first time creator on on kickstarter that's the other the obstacle you're, you're the hurdle you have to jump over is like you know that without a track record uh some of these other companies aren't even going to look your way in unless you pay a little bit more than the people that are already sort of established because the real the other reality is the distribution gaming distribution following kickstarters is bogged down i, yes. I think what was it 900 Absolutely. and some board game projects last year funded right and like we we have looked into several and as it turns out those several are about all there are as far as distribution yeah. goes. So right. you're, you're going to be using, you know, one of a handful one way or another. And yeah, of course, yeah. Like I'm, I'm an avid Kickstarter backer myself. I know that some companies <laughs> have a reputation. I have tried yeah. to avoid those when possible, but at the same time yeah. there, there are limitations on what you can do, especially if you're a smaller company. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but there were hiccups, and you you seem to overcome uh, almost all of them at this point. Now, is the the ship is in route, or is, is it landed in, in most areas at this point, and distribution is kicking off? Uh, most ships have arrived. Um, mm -hmm. Fulfillment has started in Asia. It should be starting in Australia next week, okay. possibly this week. At the end of the week, U.S. is in the works. Um, we're waiting. Uh, it has arrived, but it has not got to the warehouse yet. So right. um, yep. we've been told probably by the end of this week. Um, and I mean, everywhere else is within the next week or two. So it's it's pretty exciting and it's getting that's, close. <laughs> that's very exciting. I'll take this opportunity to actually mention, uh, if you didn't have a, have a chance to back this project, um, uh, Richard was kind enough to go ahead and publicly release the tabletop simulator version of this game on tabletop simulator through the workshop. So, um, if you really want to try it and if you did back it and you want to get your hands on it to sort of get, work out all the, all the learning kinks before you that hit your table, uh, please, uh, jump on tabletop simulator and download the Dinogenics workshop item. Uh, Ken, who we, we, we met at, at PAX, uh, designed this uh, implementation in Tabletop Simulator. And I, I have to say, Ken always blows me away with his designs and his scripting. Uh, what was your experience working with Ken? Oh, Ken was great. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we had originally been looking for somebody to do this for us. Uh, one thing is we really wanted to get the game into everybody's hands by the end of the year. That yeah. didn't happen, obviously, as we're in January now. But we thought this would be a great way for, you know, the tide people over until the real thing arrives. Mm -hmm. And Ken kind of blew us away with uh, some of the things he was able to pull off. We originally <laughs> were expecting a rather simple version, you know, basic right. setup and things like that. And he came back at us with like point tracking and keeping track <laughs> of the reputation values. And it's just it's it's remarkable. It really is. I, I'm very happy to work with him. It takes a lot of headache out of out of the setup. And tabletop simulator is its own beast because of, of of the way things move, and it's not completely natural. But the scripting that he did for this does cut a lot of that extra busy work you would have in tabletop sim out of the equation, and it really gives you a pure experience of, of what this game plays like. Um, so we are we are touching on the greatest uh, challenge you you had overcome with this. Um, I guess what what is your personal favorite game mechanic um i'm not sure that i have a favorite game mechanic uh i i enjoy in a lot of ways i enjoy like the the overall experience of a game like i like experiencing mm -hmm. a game that makes you feel like you're actually in the the role of something as opposed to being you know playing a game that's simulating a role uh right. that that may be a bit hazy, my my uh, difference there, but um, uh, basically yeah. the, the idea is I like games that are thematically driven and make you feel like you are actually doing the thing. Like it doesn't really right. matter what it is so much. Like you could be uh, you know, a cargo logistics person as long as the right. game actually made you feel like that, as opposed to 
you know, moving a meeple onto the board or right. collecting a cube. So it's not really a specific mechanic that draws you to a game. It's how not well so the much. theme marries to that mechanic, and if it, yes. if, it, if, it if it accurately simulates, which is awesome. I, I'm I'm the same way, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I'm also uh, a Kickstarter addict as well. So you know, hey, high five on that. You know, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so. What are your predictions? This is this is this is this digs a little bit. Not digs, but you, uh, you might have to reflect a little bit on this. Uh, what are your predictions for crowdfunding this year? I within the, within the modern board gaming space. I think it's going to get bigger, but not necessarily bigger for the people that need it uh, most. Right. Um, I see a lot of the big. Uh, producer is getting into Kickstarter a lot larger because honestly, why wouldn't they? It right. reduces all risk from funding a product. Yep. And it makes them like it tells you what your audience for this product is before you yeah. invest any money in it. it. It does. And it gives you that blast marketing, that social media. I mean, they're already pinging social media anyway, uh, but but it gives you that massive audience growth uh, from the Kickstarter. Um, so you know, even if you already have distribution lines set up for the game, you could throw it on Kickstarter and then boom, your first order is already covered. You're you're already into your double or triple production line. So so you could just hit those hit hit your uh, uh, main uh, sources of distribution. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and, and I also agree that that's that's, in, that's unfortunate um, because I feel like there's like you mentioned, it, it was really recently that a lot of these really, really design ideas and designers creating these ideas have been hitting the forefront in modern board gaming and that was i think mainly due to the kickstarter and you know they could run their own project and prove that you know this crazy idea they had works um because when you're when you're just sitting across the table from somebody who is writing you a check they're going to be a lot more critical than a thousand or three thousand somebody's that are going to write you a check right sure um, and, and I'm seeing, I've seen a lot this past year, um, where the larger, uh, production companies, uh, distribution companies and everything are utilizing Kickstarter to sort of recruit in these games, you know, a game hits and, uh, like, you, you, let's say you hit 3000 copies, all of a sudden, you know, you're getting all these calls from, you know, these other mainline distri distributors and, and production people. And they're like, hey, listen, why don't you join our team? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you, you did all the legwork in Kickstarter, but you know, let's take take that out the burden off you. We'll give you a percentage on residuals. Uh, but now, why why try to go in business yourself? Why don't you join our team? Right? You're, I'm sure you probably dealt with some of that in the back end too, right? Uh, there there were some that came forward, but it's it's kind of an awkward situation where in order to take one of those deals, you give up so your much. Baby. You give up your baby. Um. Uh, and and uh, I'd like to add, ping you and ask you personally because I've been reflecting on this a lot. I, I I do a little bit of design as, well, and I've been spoken with so many designers. Um, what do you feel? How do you feel the role of designer? Do you do you feel that the role of designer is going to ever change in the industry, um, based on how little is sort of contributed financially to that area, or do you feel like they're just gonna, it's just going to stay that way? Like because right now designers probably make the smallest percent of anybody involved in these projects, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's tight. Um, which is, which is crazy. Cause that's what props up a good game. Mm -hmm. So, so do you, do you think that change or do you, do you think it's, it's always going to be, you know, the designers scrap, scraping for their things, putting out 10 or 15 designs, hoping three of them catch so they can pay the bills. You know what I mean? I, I think it, it really depends on, on how well the, the designers, uh, games are carried by the market yeah. like i i can think of some great games with great designers but they they kind of failed commercially and and you know they get kind of left by the wayside right. and then you you know you kind of get stuck in that uh going back to the big the, the big publishers at that point where um if you're not able to do it on your own you do become kind of a cog in the machine at which point right. you're, you're relegated to as you said like a small percentage of the the overall pie so right 
Um, right. If it's going to change, I, I actually feel like the ability for it to change kind of missed its mark by the fact that the big publishers are getting the Kickstarter now. There was like an opportunity for the small guys to get ahead for a little while. Yeah. But as you know, this year and future years go on, I think that that margin for that potential is going to get smaller and smaller, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah which is unfortunate. Um, but we'll see. I mean, who knows? Some maybe something crazy will happen. <laughs> uh, Hopefully. Yeah, I have. I actually have a question from chat, uh, and the first one I have for you here is uh, One Day West Games, uh, also uh, good friends of mine uh, from my area here. Uh, did Monster Highway. Uh, they want to know what your inspiration for designing this specific Dinogenics was. Um, a, a couple things. Like I, I had mentioned uh, a background in computer games. The old like roller coaster tycoon games were some of my favorite. Yeah. And I, I really started to think of how could you translate that to a board game? And um, there was another game I've actually in uh, interviews before mentioned uh, that I took some inspiration from Caverna. Okay. That's no secret. Uh, there are some shared mechanics, and it seemed like pairing the two of those actually works rather well together um, yes. as far as having an individual player board uh, and really uh, emphasizing the customization of an individual. So it's kind of like a blending of those mechanics and adding a little bit of uh, myself into the game as well as far as, you know, kind of embracing the more thematic side of running a dinosaur park as opposed right. to the, uh, the you know, the, the queue pushing or money management of the game. Right. And, 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 it, and it comes off well. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to get to the table, but I do want I still want to ping you because this, is, this has been great and I re appreciate your time tonight. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I appreciate it. Um, so, I get, I, I do want to address the the elephant, or as as Paul wrote in his review of, of the game that we played on Saturday, um, Apostle G, who's a member of our community, uh, put a board game geek uh, board game geek review up. You guys can check that out. Um, but uh, the elephant in the room, or he, as he said, the brontosaurus in the room, uh, Dinosaur Island, um, happened around the same time uh, you were you were going for your funding. Uh, could you walk me through the experience of that theme competition? Um, and then what, what did you do or what would, what would you have done now knowing that happened uh, to address the problem differently based on that experience? Uh, so that whole was interesting. Um, we had basically started putting up materials on board game geek uh, in the, the year before the launch of Dinosaur Island on Kickstarter. And we were originally planning to release this at about the same time as they launched their campaign. They basically beat us by a little over a week, believe it or not. Right. right. Um, and upon seeing that, like, uh, I, I check kick track quite frequently. So track of the, you know, the top 10 or top 20 most popular Kickstarter Right. Uh, titles and right. I saw that at the top and I was like huh I wonder if that's anything <laughs> like my game right. and then I clicked on the link and I looking at the design and seeing the player boards and like a, a little bit of my soul deflated that day <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you're so excited going into it. you're like oh I'm going to be launching this week yes and then you like go to click track and you're like uh, wait but, but, what? but after that like <laughs> right. you know I I read up on their game. I flipped through the rule book, obviously. And yeah. like I realized that the game's, you know, aesthetic aside were actually pretty different experiences. They they I can vouch for you know, that after yeah. after that initial disappointment, I, I kind of got over it. Um and basically what we ended up doing is pushing back the launch of the game by a couple months because obviously we didn't want to be accused of being or anything like that right. um so we pushed it back we continued to refine what we were doing and we tried not to you know dwell on on uh the 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 pastel masterpiece that had taken over kickstarter <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um right but yeah you know um they they beat us to the market that's yeah. 
no no hostility there really aside from you know the the initial disappointment of missing the boat a little bit there of course but i mean yeah at at this point i I was just gonna say it speaks volumes to the fact that you still put in three thousand from your, your campaign um so there was there were obviously discerning eyes that looked at the two and, and compared them and said, this is the game I want compared to that one. Or they backed both, which is possible as well. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I could say um, I could say 100% that that they're two very different games. They play very, very differently. Uh, I'll reserve any specific uh, comparisons, um, but but really um, they're unique experiences. So if, if, if anybody who's watching has Dinosaur Island, I could tell you that this is a very different game, and specifically, if you're looking more for the the theme married to the mechanics, uh, I will tell you that this is this is more of a game for that. I will say that. Um, but yeah, so sorry you went through that, but I think all of us that's that's something that that's everybody has to, you know, you can't prepare for something like that, right? Uh, I don't know. You, you cut out there. Are you there with me, Richard? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and ultimately, uh, that in of itself was a learning experience for the whole thing as well, because uh, uh, we had to make ourselves stand out when being compared directly to a game that on the surface looks very similar, right. but mechanically is quite unique. Right. Yeah. And, and what, what, like, what tactics? I mean, what, what, did, what, what did you? How did you go about doing that? break break the mold there or or trying to explain how how the how how did you present that i guess is the best way to put that uh i mean the the biggest thing um was really just trying to communicate with the the fine basically like we were pretty active on reddit for a while um active on board game geek and basically just trying to um, interact directly with people that had questions, because obviously you do see a game that looks very, very want. You want to know why it's unique, how it stands out, right, which one right. do you prefer? And so uh, I've always been very open with things that uh, I think stand out from the uh, Dinosaur Island. Yeah. Um, you know... Uh, away from some things that are similar as well because you know they're both board <laughs> games they're both running a dinosaur park so there right. are going to be some similarities of course of course um so now on to a bit of the fun questions uh what is your guilty pleasure game guilty pleasure game hmm Uh, I, I I don't I don't know. Well, I mean, a so, game that's so, not very good that I still play, or kind of, kind of, or in the eyes of like a mo- the modern world. So, sort of, I always uh, my example is always Monopoly. I am an avid Monopoly fan, and if I say that in the wrong group of people, I get looks. <laughs> <laughs> is there any game like that for you um, that you love to play, but in certain circles you don't? announced <laughs> i don't know that i'm really ashamed of any of the games uh right. i play pro like looking back one of my favorite games which most people have moved on from at this point is mm-hmm. the the first edition of mansions of madness which okay yeah which is you know one of the original dungeon master type games uh yeah. you know four versus one and it's a game that i I absolutely love. Uh, it has a horrible setup time. No, yes, <laughs> no defense there, but it offers an experience that I still think is. And with the second edition, they got rid of the game master role, which was always the role that I enjoyed playing the most. Interesting, which, yeah. Which uh, made it far less high on my list of uh, interest. Um, yeah. But no, I I would still play the original. Anytime people were up for it, basically, that's and great. I know most people have moved on from it, but I, I guess that's probably my best answer. <laughs> no, that's and and that's that's good because you're right. Uh, a lot of once the second edition hit, they had another surge in sales because of all the people that didn't want to DM a session. Uh, sure, they just they just wanted the the board game to handle that for them, and 
Fantasy Flight did a good job in 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 letting the app control aspects of that, but but you'd lost aspects of the storytelling because they would just give yes. you generic mythos where if you were the DM, you could come up with fun stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, but no, that's that's awesome. Um, so, is there anything else that you'd like to? Anybody you'd like to thank? Any, anything you'd like to plug? Any announcements you'd like to make around what you're working on, or any plans you might have uh, before we we transition to the table today? Um, right now, uh, I we want to keep things kind of tight, but we do have a couple projects in the work right now. We're kind of still waiting to see uh, how distribution goes here. Um, yeah. Before getting to uh, delving too much in that. Obviously, we we care about our backers. We don't want to move it on until everybody has what they paid for, basically. Right. So, yeah, you know, uh, we do have some plans, uh, things in the works, but uh, nothing to announce just yet. Okay. Well, what I will do for you is, uh, Matt, if you don't mind, uh, throw the link up for the newsletter uh, because there is going to be a limited quantity available of the game they, once all the backers get their games. And um, Richard's going to be sending out an update to anybody who's interested in purchasing the game of any comp- any copies they have left after uh, the the fulfillment ends. Um, so uh, if you guys follow that link, uh, Matt's going to throw it up in chat. Um, you could sign up for the newsletter, and then you'll know when you could uh, possibly get your hands on this game. Uh, outside of the giveaway we're doing tonight for it, um, you know that's the, your your best way of getting it because. As of right now, there's no plans to to do a second printing. But you know, if you guys are very generous and sell out of those things for Richard, I'm sure he will be very, very much more acclimated to um, <laughs> <laughs> to doing a second printing. Um, but uh, so Apostle G just I, I did see something in chat real quick. I'm going to tell. I, he says, tell Richard Keen that I just got a message from Pandasaurus Games and they would like to know as soon as possible any ideas he may have for game designs. <laughs> <laughs> apostle. <laughs> Stop it. You're that is bad. Bad apostle G. Um, <laughs> uh, um so yeah, so uh thank you very much for joining us for the interview. Um, you know, uh, we really appreciate all the information you gave us. Um, you're always welcome to join us again uh, if, if anything changes and if you have any other news. Um, but but thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Sure. Thank you for having me. It's fun.